There are many Kirov organizations around the world. There are different yeshivas that are involved in getting people to learn, taking the adult beginner from, from the basics to whatever level they're willing to go. What makes us different? It's not just that Rav Noach was the first. And it's not just that there are different styles around, the means. But Rav Noach had a different goal than everybody else. And that goal, to this very day, I think one could say is outside the consensus. The world of Kirov. The world of Kirov is all about taking people getting them to experience different aspects of the beauty of Judaism and getting them to become fully observant Jews. Now, of course, Rav Noach did a lot of that. That wasn't the goal. The goal was the whole of the Jewish people. Even if that meant that you weren't going to make too many people fully observant. But for every Jew to want to be Jewish, to want to marry Jewish, to have a relationship with the Creator, to know the Torah is true, even if he's not ready to keep it, North, that was the goal. I remember we used to fight it out with different, uh, different people involved in cure of people who built organizations. And it seemed like everyone agreed that if you could put a total end to intermarriage versus making two people fully observant, I guess putting an end to intermarriage would be the right thing to do. But as soon as the numbers started getting higher, Rabnal found himself alone. This is a real ideological question. And it's a question in halacha. What should we be putting our efforts into? Getting all the Jews to be ma'aminim. Or focusing on a smaller number, but making sure that they become authentically observant. So I'd like us to go through, first the sukya, to see where the issues lie. Then we can talk about where Ibn Noach was coming from. So we begin here, the Mishnah and Sanhedrin tells us, first Mishnah, kol Yisrael yeshlem, chelik olam haba. Chal Yisrael incorporated this into Pirkei Avos. It comes from Sanhedrin. It's a wonderful reminder that the default position of a Jew is that he's a ben olam haba. 
He's eternal. Your nation, they're all tzaddikim. La'olam Yushu Aretz. Forever, they will inherit, inherit the land. We're talking about la'olam forever. That's eternity. Neitzar matoi masi odolo ispoer. Hashem planted us. We grew off that. Takes pride in us. Then the Mishnah says, It is possible for a Jew to do something to lose his Olam Abba. What does the Mishnah say? Someone who denies the afterlife. Or someone who says the Torah is not from heaven, it's not divine. He loses Olam Abba. Then we have this third one who's an Apikoris. It is one or another form of Mavaza Talmidei Chachami. Either he actually embarrasses the Talmud Chacham, embarrasses someone else in front of the Talmud Chacham, or calls the Talmud Chacham, or calls his Rebbe by his first name. So essentially what the Mishnah is telling us is that in order to lose one's Olam Abba, it's got to be that he's lacking in his emuna, Be it in the afterlife, be it in the authenticity of Torah as being divine. We have another sugya. Perhaps before introducing the sugya, have to explain where it's coming from. The sugya talks about all, all kinds of uh, lawbreakers and how they're treated. The most severe are the ones that we should kill. They are not executed after a trial embedded in the Sanhedrin. They just have to be gotten rid of. They include people who do severe things. We're not talking about someone who murdered. We're talking about people that do things that go against the essence of Judaism. Why do you kill them? The Chazonish takes for granted that their existence, remember, the Jewish nation was observant. We all started off wrong. The Jewish nation was observant. When some individual would get up there and show that it's possible to live a lifestyle devoid of observance, that was a chilul Hashem. He is showing people that the possibility exists. That it's possible to be a Jew and a idolater at the same time. We've got to make a strong statement to get rid of the Chil Hashem. And there's no stronger statement than actually getting rid of it. Says the Chazon Ish. In this day and age, if we'd start executing people, because they have different beliefs and do different things, would that be Makadeh Shem Shamayim? What's it gonna do? They'll simply send a message around the world that observant Jews are violent. Says the Chazanish, how do we fulfill this halacha today? By being Makar of them. So I always say, if you know a zealot, and he loves mitzvahs like executing people, tell him, as a zealot, your role in this day and age is to do kiruv. But what does it say here? So let's read the Gemara. The very first part is, is dealing with Ovdei Kachavim, which is non-Jews, Veroi Be'em Madaka. These were people that would take their, their animals and graze on everybody else's lawn. You know, those, these were people who identified themselves, this is the way the Raman learns it, who identified themselves with theft. Their whole being was a disrespect for other people's belongings. 
You can't kill such a person. But if his life is in danger, don't get involved. Don't go out of your way to save him. Aval, haminim v'amasores v'amumrim hoyu moridim v'lo malim. Amin is an apikoris. There are different names for them. The Ramam actually switches them once in a while. Masoris, people who are constantly turning others into the government for things that they did that are not against halacha. Vamumari. Mumarim are people that don't keep, that don't observe. Hoyumaridim then you can kill. The Gemara says, Hoyumaridim, they did. Had the Gemara written, they do, the censor would have taken it out. So this is what Rabbi Avo said in front of Rabbi Yochanan. So Rabbi Yochanan had a problem. He said, Ani shona l'chol avedis achicha l'rabbis is a mumer. The mitzvah of returning a lost object applies even to a mumer, a sinner. How could you tell me that the sinner you don't, you know, the sinner you can kill and you return his lost object? Ba'at amr toyu moridin? Somi mikan mumer. Drop that. That means Rabbi Avo was teaching a brisa in front of Rabbi Yochan. He said, you must be mistaken. The word mumer didn't appear there. So the Gemara asks, There are two kinds of mumer. There's somebody who eats non-kosher because he likes it. There's someone who eats non-kosher because he wants to make a point. The Torah says, you can't eat it, I will eat it anyway. A mumer lahachis, kill him. Or the Chazanish would say, be makarav. A mumer meaning this is not ideological. He just has a hard time dealing with his desires. He doesn't eat kosher, he eats non kosher because he likes it. And you don't kill. It's the one that's doing it as an act of rebellion. Says the Gemara Kasover, Ochel Nevelas Lahach is Minhu. Someone who eats Nevela, someone who eats non kosher. Lahachis? He does it to rebel? We don't call him a mumer. We call him a mean. We call him an apikoris. We call such a person an apikoris. So when the Bryce has said Mumrim, it couldn't be referring to him. And then the Gemara tells us there are actually two opinions. We have a machlokis. What is a mumer? Does a mumer include a mumer lahachis? Or is that mumer lahachis really not because? What we see from here is that it is possible to be called an apikoris for one's actions. Either he does things lahachis, or oved alvila kachavim, someone who worships idols. Now, this Gemara is not talking about losing your share in Olam Abba, but it's using the same kind of wording. It's calling him a mean, which is in the same category as someone whose beliefs are off. The question is, does he also lose his Olam Abba? Do they all go together? We have a third one, and that's this Gemara, and the Gemara is a bit complicated. The Gemara there is talking about from whom do we accept the sacrifice and then have it brought in the base of Mikdash. On the one hand, it says you bring one, for, you, you do accept from a mumer, and the other one says you don't accept from a mumer. And the Gemara comes out that someone who worships idols, or someone who is Mechalel Shabbos before Hesia, which means he blatantly breaks Shabbos in front of others in, the pub, in public, or a mumer lechola Torah kula, which means he just doesn't consider himself observant. 
All three of those, we won't accept a carbon from them. Whereas a sinner, someone who has a hard time, he's challenged, saved back to kosher. We will accept the sacrifice from him. So what we have here is all kinds of categories, but basically there are two big ones. One is dealing with a person's beliefs. And there we know that someone who doesn't see Torah as being divine, he has no share in the world to come. Then we have all of these people that have issues with observance. There's a mumra lahachis, who possibly is a mean to the two opinions. We also have someone that is an idol worshiper, someone who openly, blatantly breaks Shabbos, or someone that just doesn't consider himself observant. And it seems like the Gemara is equating them, except that we're talking about different halachas. So the Ran, the Ran here in source four is the one that puts them all together. He seems to say that you can put all the Gemaras together. Which would mean that someone who is a Machal Shabbos before Hesia, he openly, blatantly breaks Shabbos, even if it's not Lachis. It's not that he's trying to rebel. He keeps his store open because it's, Saturday is the biggest business day. But it's open, it's public. He has the same Allah as I mean, as someone who doesn't believe in Torah and Hashemah, even if he would. Similarly, someone just says, I'm not observant. It's not relevant to me. I'm not, I'm not observant. And of course, my dollar. So it seems like we have two classes of people that end up in the same place. The ones who don't believe and the ones who could be do believe, but don't keep. And it's either blatantly breaking Shabbos or idolaters or just don't consider themselves observant. Now, before we go any further, if this is the case, then getting someone to believe without getting him to observe will still leave him in the category of a mean. He's still like an Abigoras. Doesn't have a share in the world to come. What are you accomplishing? That's just to begin with. So this has been for Talmud Chachamim. The ones that claim that just getting Jews to believe without observing is really not accomplishing it. They still remain up in course. Which now brings us to the second half. What is the halacha of somebody? that blatantly breaks Shabbos, but he, he, he never heard of Shabbos. <sighs> he never heard of Shabbos. That's the first thing about it. He's a show gig. We understand, not only that, the Gemara tells us, and the Rambam brings it while Allah. If someone knows that a Jew should be keeping Shabbos, and he even knows that the Torah says you get thrown off the cliff if you don't keep Shabbos, but he doesn't know 
that the halachi is that if you do something out of negligence, you have to bring a chatas, a sin offering. He's called a shogig because he doesn't know all the details of it. He doesn't know just how severe it is. He knows there's chorus. But he doesn't know that he'd have to bring a sacrifice if you do it with a shogig. He's called a shogig. A shogig means he gets no chorus for it. It means he has to bring the sacrifice. So it's clear that when we're talking about a machalal Shabbos before Hesya as being an apikoris, it means he knows that you got to keep Shabbos. He knows the severity of breaking Shabbos. He also has to know the halachas of where he's breaking Shabbos. What's he doing wrong in opening his shop on Shabbos? If he does as a shogig, you're going to call the man an apicorus because he's a shogig? So that is true when it comes to all Averas. Anyone does an Avera and doesn't really know that it's prohibited or doesn't understand the severity. He's a shogig. You can call him an apicorus. There's a different question. What about a shogig when it comes to emunah? What about a shogig when it comes to all the different things that are, the Ramam counts as the, fundament, the fundamentals of Judaism, the Yud Gimeli Kari, where if one does not have emunah in them, then he's in the category of this mission of losing his share in the world to God. What about if he didn't know any better? What about there? Is he also a shogig? What is he? So let's first start. The Shulchan Aruch deals with the case of the Karoim, the Karites. The issue here is you're not allowed to lend a Jew money and take interest for it. When it comes to Jews, the Torah wants us to invest with one another, believe in one another, not just give the money and I want my, I want my interest. For non-Jews, there's nothing wrong with taking interest. There's nothing immoral, unethical about taking interest. I can lease you my car. I can rent you my apartment. Why can't I rent you my money? There's nothing unethical about it. For a Jew, the Torah wants us to put ourselves out. It's considered unethical to lend the Jew money and take interest rather than invest with him. Now, to earn the title Jew for this halacha, Gemara tells us you've got to be called what the Pasuk refers to as a picha, your brother, and what it means is your brother in observance. So the Shulchan Aruch is dealing with the case of the Karaites who did not believe in the oral law. They had their, interpret, their own interpretation of Torah Shabbat Sav, the written law. They didn't believe in the oral law. So he says, Elim din mumari. They are not mumari. Why not? You see, when they started out, the first ones knew better. But their followers today the B'nai Akaroim as they are. They just follow what they were taught. They don't know any better. You can't call this man a mummer. You're allowed, you're not allowed to take interest from him. He's Jewish. And the Ramah adds to that. Tinok Shanishpa A Jewish kid was kidnapped in infancy and was brought up by non-Jews. He doesn't know anything about Judaism. Someone told him he was Jewish, but he knows nothing about that. He's like the Karayim, but also all the Slobaridis. Therefore, and this was a case that the Rishonim discussed, 
Mumeres lavolus kachadim. What happens? A Jewish woman leaves the fold, gets baptized, and marries out. Marries a non-Jew. She is lo ben minovet kachadim. She's got a son from this non-Jew. He's Jewish. His mother's Jewish. All the baptismal waters in the world cannot make a Jew not Jewish. So she's Jewish and her son is Jewish. Shaben arayu kamolha. Venikra mumur. He's like her. We call her a mumur. We call him a mumur. No, also all the slobarimis. It's not his fault. They don't go chavim. He doesn't know any better. It's as if he was kidnapped by non Jews. What does he know already? Now, what's with these Kalroi? They don't believe in Torah Shabbat Peh. Their observance, of course, is not in accordance with Torah Shabbat Peh as a result of it. So their actions are off, their beliefs are off, and yet the Shulchan Aruch is willing to accept them as being Achicha. So the Shulchan Aruch seems to hold that if someone did, doesn't know any better, he's not an Apikoris. Whether it's for his beliefs or for his actions, he's not an Apikoris because he doesn't know any better. This is the Shulchan Aruch. Now we get to the Rambam. We're working a little backwards. The Rambam comes first. The Rambam, when he lists off those that don't have chilek le'olam abba, they are in an eternal state of losing existence. Just take a few seconds to mention just what this means. You know, one would think someone that does have all all right, big deal, here's an all What a way, you know, it's a shame. All is a great thing. So I don't have all no, no. That first moment of being cut off from existence lasts forever. They are eternally in that state. Because once you reach out there, there's no time. They are eternally in a state of being cut off from existence. It's not just that they lose their role in our body. They are in an eternal state of being conscious of the fact that they don't have an existence, that they become non-entities. It's hard to imagine what that feels like. But it's probably not very nice. Who are they? Hamimim, apikorsim, akofim b'torah, akofim b'tchiyas ha'meis, a whole list here. In the next halacha, the Ramam says, halacha zayin, chamishahim anikroim minim. There are five that are called minim, that, right? That lose their chelik and olam haba. Ha'omer she'ein shem elokah. Someone Khalila says there's no creator. Elo lomani, Hashem doesn't run the world. Ha'omer she'yesh shemani gavalim shtayim ayoser. There's someone that runs the world. It's a, it's a family that runs it. It's a, it's a partnership up there. Ha'omer she'yesh shem ribon echod. Ava shugguf ubal t'muna. Anyone that sees... The creator is being finite. The Rambam writes that such a person is a mean. He loses his olam abba. So first of all, the whole logical basis for Hashem's existence is the fact that their finite existence, if one believes that the creator is finite, then he just destroyed the basis for all logical acceptance of the creator. But let's say he did. The Raman calls him a mean. So the Raivin on the spot pounces on the Raman. How can you say such a thing? First of all, there are those that held that way among the Gaonim. We don't really know what, 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 what they could have been thinking. But aside from that, he says, you got a simple guy. He reads the Psukim. And it says Hashem took the Jews out of Egypt with an outstretched arm. And he believes it. And he imagined this outstretched arm. He reads in Avua that before Mashiach comes, Hashem will stand, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. And he believes that's going to happen. We're going we're to see a pair of feet there. Poor guy. 
takes it literally. He's a bit simple, but he's a believer. The Rambam called him an apicarist and says that he doesn't have a chelik in all of them. The Rambam says, what do you want from this poor guy? You know, he's so committed. What do you want from him? The Rambam nevertheless called him an apicarist, called him a said he lost his chelik in all of So what's Pshan in him? So here you've got this whole thing where Rebbechan Wasserman goes through what he heard from his Rebbe, Reb Chaim Brisker. And Reb Chaim said that loss of Olam Haba for lack of emuna is not a punishment. It has nothing to do, it has nothing to do with whether or not this person could have done better. Rabbi Chaim says it's a reality. You cannot have an eternal relationship with the Creator if you don't believe He exists. If you don't establish your emuna in this world, it is not possible to have a relationship with the Creator in the world to come. And by the way, this is a very important point just in terms of someone who sees everything in finite terms, when he dies, there's no hope for this guy. Because his senses cease to function. Nothing finite means anything to him anymore. If he never established within himself a relationship to anything that is not finite, to anything spiritual, anything meaningful, everything is just measured in its finiteness. This poor guy is in trouble forever. He has absolutely no way of experiencing where he is or understanding it. That's eternal agony. But that was what Chaim said. Now, that would answer the Rambam. That would answer the Rambam. You know what that would mean? That would mean that unlike what we saw in the Shulchan Aruch, someone who really was brought up, brainwashed, taught that Khalil Hashem doesn't exist. Such a person would not have Olam Abba. And the same thing going for Torah and Shemaim and everything else that the Ramam lists there, which means that the Karoim that the Shulchan Aruch spoke about would not have a Chelik in Olam Abba. Rabbi Khan has a problem with that. He says, so what does that mean? Every cute infant is really an Apikoris because he doesn't have Emunah? And chas v'sholem, chas v'sholem, the kid passes away. Before he's old enough to think, he won't have olam haba. So Reb Chaim could never have said, he could never have meant such a thing. Shabbat Chana says something totally different. He says, emuna is so simple. It's so, no matter where you approach it from, whether it's from the life experience, whether it's just seeing nature, understanding the complexity of the human being, studying world history, or simple reasoning that finiteness cannot explain itself. Wherever you come from, Emuna is so simple and straightforward. Unless you really push yourself to think in a crooked way, you've got to be a mind. Says Rabbi Hanan, but what if you've been brainwashed into not thinking? What if you've been brainwashed into not even considering the possibility? To be able to see through your education on your own and find it, that's a tall order. Says Rabbi Hanan, for someone who reads the psukim and takes them literally, unless he is mentally impaired, he should understand that that couldn't be. He's just not bothering to think about it. You don't bother thinking? You're not because. The Jews required to think. 
Whereas the Karoyim, who were brought up by their parents who told them, don't take these, uh, they don't take the Orthodox Jews seriously. Anyone growing up in a world where, whether they're taught it by society, by the media, Orthodox Jews are outdated, we're cavemen, we're fanatics. Torah is oppressive. It discriminates. All the rotten things they say. People that were brought up by that. And they know all observant Jews are terrible, except for the ones they've met. So what do you want? Can't blame the guy. So Elchanan is willing to accept the concept of shogeg, of tinik shenishpah, when it comes to emuna, but only if he's been brainwashed. If it's because he made the mistake on its own, that's inexcusable because any thinking person should have figured it out. Oh, a two-year-old is the same, is no worse than someone brainwashed, meaning since he couldn't possibly figure it out because he's too young, he obviously has a cheder global about going to Rebbe Khan. Now, is Rebbe Khan his answer? His own question. So we have, we have what he quotes from Rav Chaim and his pshat in Rav Chaim. And the question is who's right? And if we take a look at the Rambam, we find that the Rambam we have sounds very much like what Rav Chaim is saying, but then there's another version of the Rambam that sounds very much like what Rav Chaim is saying. And let's go through it. In the Torah, we find a parsh of Zokin Mamre, which is a member of the Sanhedrin, where after they voted in a certain direction, he comes out and openly preaches against them. He's a Zokin Mamre. He's executed. You know, lots of violence in today's shir. That's a Zokin Mamre. Says the Rambam, He's not the Zokin Mamre. If someone does not believe in Torah Shabbat Peh, he's not a Zokim Amrael. Anyone can kill him. You don't need the Sanhedrin to vote to put him to death. You kill him and you don't save his life. They have Remove themselves from the Jewish nation. You don't need witnesses. They didn't have to be warned. This doesn't call for judges. You don't need a sitting of the Sanhedrin. You don't need a session of the Sanhedrin to declare them such. Like I mentioned before, this is a, he's a walking chilol Hashem. He's showing people that there's a possibility of a Jew living in that way. And again, the Chazanish would say that in this day and age, execution will be replaced by Kirov. Bamed Varam Amuri. Says the Ramam, who are we talking about? Somebody who came to the conclusions of his own. Meaning, he grew up an observant Jew, starts thinking, comes to the conclusion this is wrong. He followed his mind, which obviously is a little light, he's a bit lightheaded. In other words, he doesn't understand the seriousness of it and didn't bother doing his own work. <laughs> Dr. Shri Libo and his heart's desires, his heart's desire for freedom, for no one telling him what to do. The cover Batarashabal He's the first, meaning he's not taking it from someone else. He is the one that is initiating this. Ketzodok Ubaitos, like the original Tzodok Ubaitos that founded the, the Tzodokim and the Baitusim. The Chinkom HaToim Acharov and those that follow them. Avo, Bnei HaToim Oyev. Not followers who started off knowing and then decided to buy into them. But people who grew up with this. Ubnei Bnei Hem, their grandchildren, Shadichos and Avosam. Whose ancestors, they're the ones that, their fathers, they went and they taught them this is right and what the observant Jews are doing is wrong. The Noldu ben Akaram, the Golos, and Maldatam, Hario Ketinik, Shanishpa, Beneam, it's like he was captured, he was kidnapped. 
the Godlu, they, they raised him. Why doesn't he keep mitzvahs? It's almost as it's, if it's beyond his control. Even though he heard later he's Jewish, and he saw observant Jews in their rules. He was taught not to take the observance seriously. The children of the Karoyim. What does the Ramam say? What do we do? We should bring them back. Till they come back to the rock of Torah, the strength of Torah. So it sounds like from the Ram, you don't kill these people. They are not Mumorim. The other version of the Rambam, the Mishnah Lamella brings it in the name of the Migdalos, and he clearly says that it seems like the, uh, the uh, uh, contemporaries of the Beis Yosef had this girsa in the Rambam. And by the way, in the Franco Rambam, he claims that the Beis Yosef had this one in the Rambam. What does it say? Don't kill them right away. Don't be hasty. First, try to be Makar them. If it doesn't work, kill them. In other words, they are Apikorsi. But because it's not their fault, give them a chance. Try to be Makar them first. So, in the words of the Chaznish, according to the Chaznish, the way it would work is you gotta be Makar them. Gotta be a car of them because it's not their fault. If that doesn't work, then you gotta be a car of them in place of killing them today. So, practically speaking, that's what it would mean. Is there such a thing as a tinnik shemishpa when it comes to a moon? The Raman we got, and the one that the Beis Yosef seems to follow because he, in Hilchas Ribbis, he's, he's saying that the Karoim are not, are not considered Mumari versus the other version of the Rambam. Rabbi Khanan's explanation works with the Shulchan Aruch and the Raman we've got. Rabbi Chaim Brisker's literal explanation goes with this other gear set. So now let's do some arithmetic. The Muna, you took care of that. In terms of his observance, he is a mumra of Nechola Tarakola. He's non observant. But he now knows he's non observant. He's not a shogig. So according to Rebbe Khanan, up until now, he was a Tinnik Shanishba, up until now, he was a fine Jew. He was brainwashed into not knowing that there's a creator. He was a Tinnik Shanishba. He will have a share in the world to come. What did you do? You turned him into a Maimon. But now he knows he should be keeping and he's not. You, you've just taken away his Olam Abba. You've just taken away his Olam Abba. This is what the Lamdonim, this is what the Lamdonim used to claim against Rav Noah's whole sheet. That according to Rav Khanan, you're taking someone who's a shogig in Deus, meaning a shogig in his beliefs, a shogig in his actions, you're correcting his beliefs but making him into a mumer of it in his actions. So what they said was, you want to get someone to believe? You got to follow through and get him to keep. Otherwise you're messing him up. You just stole his Olam Abba. Now according to Chaim, he didn't have a share in, in Olam Abba anyway. According to Chaim Brisker, anyone that doesn't have a moon, even if it's not his fault, he doesn't have the stuff of Olam Abba. He can't have an eternal relationship with the Creator because he doesn't know what that is. So he's nowhere. So what did you do? You made him a Maimon. But he still won't have Olam Abba because he's considered a Min because he's non-observant. So you haven't ruined it for him, but what have you accomplished? This is basically the, the way that Lam done him
discredit the entire shita of making Jews into ma'aminim at the expense of not, uh, rather than, making a smaller number into observant Jews. Sounds like a very good question. So first, Rav Noah said, something's wrong here. Rav Noah used to say, listen, the arithmetic may not work, but something's wrong here. And the marshal he always used to use was a father asks his kid, can you bring me a glass of water? The kid says, no. It's painful. What if he asks the kid for a glass of water and the kid says, eh, who are you? You're not my father. Which is worse? So he used to say, what does Hashem want? Okay, he's asking us to do mitzvahs and people aren't keeping mitzvahs. Terrible thing. You're going to tell me that you're accomplishing nothing by getting people to at least acknowledge that he's Hashem? That he's our father? Couldn't be. Just couldn't be. We, we got to do something to work out the arithmetic, but, but it just couldn't be. It couldn't be that the person's in the very same place he was before. It couldn't be. Maybe it's not enough. But in terms of answering, really answering the question. So the best place to look, I believe, is the Ramam and Sefer Mitzvahs under the mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem. Just listen to the words of the Ramam and Sefer Mitzvahs. Remember, the mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem is to give your life for a moon. Right? If someone asks you, you believe, you don't believe, he's standing over with a gun. If you say you believe, he's going to shoot you. You're supposed to say, I believe, and be ready to lose your life over it. That's the mitzvah. So the words of the Rambam. Ha-mitzvah atashiyas, hu shetzivonu l'kadesh Hashem, v'hu amro, v'nikdashti b'sov b'nei Yisroel, v'inyin zos ha-mitzvah sh'anachtu m'tsuvim l'far seim u'amuna ha-zos ha-mitis ba'olam. We are commanded to publicize this emunah, this true emunah in the world. At any expense, we should be fearless. I'm saving this guy's Olam Abba. I'm not saving his Olam Abba. You can do all your calculations. We have an obligation. This is the mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem. We have an obligation to see to it that every Jew knows he was created. The chiv of being a Kaddish Shem Shemayim. The truth is this chiv applies not only to let every Jew know, but to let every non-Jew know as well. But we begin with our own. We have a chiv, the mitzvah of being a Kaddish Shem Shemayim. Get ready to give your life for this. We have him a farsim emuna. That's the chiv of Kiddush Hashem. Sit there making a cheshbin, but this guy may, you know, you're, you're turning him into a mumer oven. First thing is, you got to let people know. You got to get people to be maminim. That's our obligation. It begins with Kiddush Hashem. That was his banner. As far as the arithmetic, as far as the arithmetic is concerned, sure, we got to do our best to get people to be observant, but not at the expense of getting more Jews to be mamini. But to automatically call everybody that is a maimin and is not ready to keep. To automatically call them a mumer l'teoven is not so simple. You know, al toden is chavercha. Ad you don't judge people till you're in their situation. For all of you who started later in life, you know what a struggle and challenge it is. 
It's one thing being brought up used to all of the restrictions the entire lifestyle but having to take it on later we appreciate the kind of work it takes certainly if you're talking about people that are even older set in their ways how many 50-year-olds are ready to turn around their whole life. And understand that, you know, unless it's a whole community growing together, it means your whole support structure is not going to be there for you. This is not a simple moral tale of it. We appreciate the struggles. Hashem will have to decide Hashem will have to decide just how far we're going to take this Mumrlete oven thing and call them meaning. So all in all, whether or not you like the, the arithmetic, we have a chiv of Kiddush and Shemai. This is what Ramel taught us. It's our Rambam. It's Pashit. Most basic obligation the Jew has got is to bring Hashem's name into the world and certainly not allow our brethren to think that it's outdated. They've got to know that Hashem created the world, sustains the world, loves us, gave us the secret to quality living, which is Torah. We've got to get every Jew to know that. And that comes first. Yes, before making a smaller number observant. So why did Noah build a yeshiva? What was the yeshiva all about? So you got to know this. What are you doing here? He felt he couldn't do it alone. He had to build an army. He needed a chabur that was going to take on the world. He wanted to create leaders. So not only is it that our goal in Kirov is so different than everyone else's, our goal in the yeshiva is different. Every one of you here has to feel responsible for the whole of the Jewish nation and be ready in any way possible to do their utmost to see to it that every Jew knows the Almighty's there and is there for us and loves us. And his Torah is authentic, it's divine, it's relevant. Yeah, we gave you the gift of Judaism in the process. But we see our role, our mission here is turning every one of you into something of a leader to feel that responsibility and take on the world, be part of the effort to take on the world. Because that's what we're about. It's Kidu Shem Shemayim. It's not about the arithmetic about this person's olam haba and that person's olam haba. It's about bringing Hashem's name into the world, which is the most basic chiyuv of every Jew. So hopefully on his yard site, you got a little bit of clarity as to what we're about and where we're coming from. I hope you get the message. We should have the siyata, the shmaya, the help from heaven to be able to reach every Jew. And as far as everyone's own Omaba, you know, if we reach every Jew, 
the guler will come. The Jewish people will be in a whole different place. The Pasuk promises that one day Hashem is going to bring everyone back. If we do our job, we can be sure he's going to do the rest for us. May the schus of Rav Noach be with us. May his teachings guide us. May his passion continue to burn inside every one of us. And may we be Zoha to get every Jew to know God exists, is very much involved in his life, and loves him. <laughs>